right, good evening everyone. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Evening, Sunday night evening service, we're getting started. If you can find your place. I'd just like to, to make a quick little announcement if I can get your attention for a second. We installed in the front row and on the back row on the wall, on the balcony and in the sanctuary here, there's a hymn rack now where you can access it from the front of the seat. So we don't have to leave hymns on the, on the chairs anymore, amen? So just a little announcement. All right, page 138 tonight, Christ the Rose. Resurrection of the Christian, amen. Praise the Lord. All right, page 211. <clears throat> 211. Maybe we should have done 211 first because it was the cross, amen, and then the resurrection, but it's all right, amen. It's good to be in church tonight, amen. amen.
try it here on the last with no instruments. Twas here the dead was paid. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Our sins on Jesus laid. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So round the cross we sing. Of Christ our offering, of Christ our living King, hallelujah for the cross, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah for the cross, hallelujah. Sing some more songs in praise to your name, Lord, and uh, uh, help us to uh, be attentive to the preaching of your word. Help us to uh, really uh, take it to heart, Lord, and help us to change our lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right, good evening, everybody. Good to have you all here tonight, again in the house of the Lord. Amen. All right. Well, the Lord's good. A um, couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, next Filipino worship service will be uh, October 8th, Filipino Thanksgiving, 5 p.m. That's this coming Saturday. So for those of you who uh, take part in that, okay, it's this coming Saturday, 5 p.m. Uh, uh, yeah. Church cleaning for October 8th. The Roberts and Terzisky family will be taking care of cleaning October 8th. And serving in the nursery next week at 10 a.m. Belma and Kara at 11 o'clock, Paula, Leila, Lombardo, and Bing. And at 6 p.m., Elsie and Alessia. At 11 o'clock, Jaira will be doing Beginner's Church. Junior Church, Miriam, and Children's Church will be Julian and Christopher, his helper. Street preaching is, go is on every Friday night at, seven at 9 o'clock, immediately after Awana. Okay, now Awana's off to a pretty good start this year, from what I see. And right after Awana, 9 o'clock, the bus gets filled up, the gospel bus. We go downtown, and we preach and give out tracts and sing. So you're welcome to join us for that. It's Friday nights, 9 o'clock. Please try to be here ready to go at 9 o'clock if you can. Uh, also, we do track passing and evangelism every Saturday morning at 1030. So um, if, you don't, if you don't come Friday nights, you can come Saturday mornings, 1030. We go out to the metro station and give out gospel tracks, usually Cote Valtier. And uh, it's good to keep that going. It, it's good to keep that going. So, uh, you know, every Saturday morning, 1030, meet here. And then it's um, prayer time, a little short time of prayer, and then straight to the metro station, Cote Valtier, for track passing. Uh, Daughters of the King, next one will be October 15th, uh, 1230. Go see Layla after the service for details. Okay, Layla Lombardo, after the service for details, it's scheduled for October 15th, 1230. And a brunch and devotional at Church for Mothers with Young Children is going to be October 15th at 11 a.m. Uh, that's going to be uh, headed up by Tiffany Onofre. So if you have any questions regarding that, go see her. Also, a friendly reminder to pay for the hotel rooms in Brockville and camps. And please, another friendly reminder. We're trying to be friendly with all our reminders. Amen. Amen. Okay, to keep all food and beverages. We don't want to be nasty reminders. We want to be friendly reminders, all right? Not me, not ugly. We're trying to be friendly about all these reminders. Pay your way, you know, for the hotel rooms, Brockville. And also, please keep all food and beverages outside the sanctuary. Water, yes, but not uh, food or beverages. Uh, you know, it's just so that we can keep our carpets and our new chairs, new carpet, uh, clean from any kind of uh, stain or anything like that. So, um, yes, we'd appreciate you uh, listening to that. So, praise the Lord. Also, yes, there's a youth group scheduled for October 8th. All right, between 12 and 3 p.m. at church. Youth group, now I gather it's Jonathan's group? Yes. Okay, Jonathan's group. Youth group, October 8th, between 12 and 3 p.m. All right, so that's at church. Jonathan, you got any questions, you can talk to him about that. So 
Also, I have to remind you, please, um, you know, don't forget that we have elections tomorrow. Yes, uh, please uh, pray for that. And uh, if you haven't voted yet, and you're going to vote tomorrow, people ask me, what do I vote for? Vote for. You vote for Conservative Party of Quebec, okay? That is the best option. I'm not saying it's a good option, but it's the best option. That's right. Okay, we, uh, we just, uh, people, uh, we try to keep politics out of the pulpit and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes it's linked with what we preach and what we believe, and we can't avoid the topic. But uh, if you're going to ask me what to vote, I don't think the Liberals are good. I don't think anybody else is good. I don't think anybody's good at all. But I would say Conservative is probably the best option that we have, okay? So... Uh, go vote tomorrow, vote for the Conservative Party of Quebec. I think that they would be the best option for liberty for the church. Yes. Okay? And that's what it's all about. We are praying that God gives us a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, homeschoolers, all that stuff, individual rights. It's th something that's uh, very important to us. So please uh, go vote tomorrow. Exercise your freedom, your right to do that, and uh, vote for the Conservative Party of Quebec. That's my... my uh, advice here and I give my advice Paul said <laughs> all right but that's my advice for you all right so praise the Lord let's have our men come forward tonight so we can receive our offering tonight in the house of the Lord and I believe the young people have a special that they're going to do so they can get that ready okay. brother Brendan please pray for us Heavenly Father we're so thankful to be in your house tonight Amen. we're so thankful for the open doors Lord where we can come and hear your truth preached Lord I Amen. just pray you please bless this offering now Lord just bless it to the furtherance of the gospel both here in this city and around the world Lord just bless all the missionaries we support Lord and I just pray Lord you help us to give with the cheerful hearts Lord help Amen. us to be cheerful givers Lord and just Lord we pray you just bless the service Lord and we'll thank you and praise you for everything you do ask it in Jesus name Amen Amen, Amen. <laughs> place that the Lord Jesus Christ spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Amen. You know where he went down there? The Bible tells us where he went. Mm -hmm. He went down to preach to the spirits in prison, the Bible says. And uh, this is an interesting song the kids learned. It has to do with when the Lord went down there. And, you know, the Bible says death and hell and everything, you know, that's, that's down in the heart of the earth. And it talks about, you know, this, the conversation that the devil had with death. Uh, when the Lord was in the heart of the earth. So it's, it's pretty good. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing. Amen. <coughs> Satan, oh Satan, tempted man to fall. God had a perfect sacrifice to die once and for all. To die once and for all. So we sent his son to die, and oh the pain he bore. They laid him in a borrowed tomb, the stone held fast the door. The saints all tell the story. That I'm about to tell About a conversation From the pits of hell From the pits of hell Tell me, death, tell me Oh, death, hear my plea Do you still have Jesus Or did you set him free? This is now the first day since they've laid him in the ground. Tell me, oh death, tell me, can you hold him down? Can you hold him down? Satan, oh Satan, Satan, hear me well. 
I promise, oh, I promise that I shall not fail, that I shall not fail. Tell me, death, tell me, this is the second day. Do you still have Jesus, or did he get away? Did he get away? Satan, oh Satan, hear me now once more. The greatest kings and rich men have walked through my dark door. And Jesus, he's no different, he's just a mortal man. And I make this vow to you, he won't escape my hand, no, he won't escape my hand. Tell me, death, tell me, tell me, don't be slow. Do you still have Jesus, or did you let him go? He's been dead for three days, the victory has been won. It's time for a celebration, we've overcome God's son. We've overcome God's son. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Satan, oh Satan, hear me what I say. This morning, oh this morning, the stone was rolled away. I couldn't stop him, no, could not hold him down. With power, oh great power, he rose up from the ground. He rose up from the ground. He has risen. He has risen. No, death where is your sting? He has risen. He has risen. Oh, proclaim him King of Kings. He has risen. He has risen, oh, he lives forevermore. He has risen, he has risen, oh, proclaim him Lord of Lords. Proclaim him Lord of Lords. He is Lord of Lords. It's talking about, oh, death, where is thy sting? Yeah. Oh, grave, amen. So this mortal shall put on immortality, this corruption in corruption, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, amen. Yeah. He didn't stay in the grave, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, 452, now let's sing, My Savior's Love. What a blessing. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Amen. amen. I was feeling like Pastor Peter this morning. You know, the flesh was like, oh, this bed is comfortable, amen. <laughs> but I got excited on my way to church, amen. Praise the Lord. 452, I'm glad I'm here tonight. I stand amazed in the prayer.
says that he suffered and died alone. Yeah. You ever feel alone in this world? Yeah. Feel like you don't have a friend or just all by yourself? The Lord Jesus Christ was totally alone on the cross. Yeah. It says, Father, why hast thou forsake me? Yeah. Even the Father, yeah. he was alone so we can go free, amen, yeah. pay for yeah. our sins. Yes. And it's beautiful. Praise so we don't have to be alone, amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. 453 453 He keeps me singing There's within my heart
Sunday, my good singing. <clears throat> Let's take our Bibles tonight, if you would, please turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17 this evening. 1 Kings chapter 17. When you find 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to start reading in verse 1. And on Sunday nights, we like to preach to God's people, Amen. and um, we need it. Amen? Amen. We need it. You know, usually Sunday morning's more the outreach time and all that. We try to show the Lord to those who may not know Him. But on Sunday night, we hope you can take a little more meat. Yes, Amen. Amen. And uh, that's what the Sunday night crowd really usually is, and the Wednesday night crowd. So. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, the Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness tonight. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for those songs, Lord, and just for the hope of the resurrection. And Lord, that it, didn't end, that it did not end at the cross. And uh, th three days later, you rose up from the ground, Lord. Father, tonight, Lord, as we hear your word preached, we pray that you'd please prepare our hearts for it and help us, Lord, to be tender-hearted towards your word. Help us, Father, that, to have good ground inside us, Lord, to have an honest and good heart, that it may bear fruit for thee, Lord. We pray, God, that your word would be exalted and magnified, that the Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted and magnified, that all flesh would be put down, Lord, that you'd be exalted here in, in our midst, Father. That we're here, Lord, for you. We're here to glorify you and to uplift your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to understand that tonight the things that we read in the Word of God are not our opinions and not the things that we wrote and not the things that we sometimes even like, but your Word makes no apology, and it says what it says, and Lord, we receive it tonight by faith, and we receive it, Lord, and with a heart of obedience, and we pray and we ask all of these things now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. First Kings chapter 17 talks about Elijah the Tishbite. He was the prophet of God, and... and uh, if you know anything about Elijah, you know that Elijah lived in the darkest times that Israel had ever faced up until that time. You know, he lived in the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, he lived at a time when the nation of Israel had gone towards worshiping Baal. If you back up there to chapter 16, verse 31, it tells you there, and it came to pass as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of F. Baal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a groove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. I mean, he, you know, Ahab was a wicked king. And the Bible does say there in verse number 3 that he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And Elijah lived in this time. Elijah lived in the darkest times that a person can live in the history of the nation of Israel. But you know what I see here in chapter 17 is that God took care of Elijah. Now we know that Elijah was the man who went up to Mount Carmel and he prayed and fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. And we think of Elijah as that great miracle worker who did all these amazing miracles. But here we see in chapter 17 a time when Elijah was, you know, like was said already during the introduction and during our song service, he was alone. Uh, but God was taking care of Elijah. God took care of him. And you know, a lot of times we... We deal with things like fear. We deal with things of fear in the future. We're worried all the time. We're, we're, we're so concerned about what's coming out in the future, what's going to happen. Uh, but when I see over here in chapter 17 what happened here, I see that God took care of his man. And God is able to take care of us. I believe that. God is able to take care of us. And I want you to see here tonight why God took care of Elijah, why Elijah was fed and he was fed well. And the first thing I want you to see here is his separation. He was a separated man. 
separated from sin. One thing we know about Elijah is he wasn't getting along with the world. As a matter of fact, Ahab the king called him the troubler of Israel. When he went up there to Mount Carmel, he was by himself versus all the prophets of Baal. They were all gathered together against him, and Elijah stood alone, but he was separated from the prophets of Baal from the wickedness of the day and time that he lived. Elijah wasn't ecumenical. Elijah wasn't interfaith. Elijah wasn't non-denominational. Elijah wasn't interdenominational. You know, I heard of somebody say one time, I, I remember Brother Luigi and I, we were visiting this this lady, and she was a Christian, and she said to us, she said, the, the church that I go to, we don't bring denominations into it. Uh, she said, we, 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 leave a, we have a big garbage can at the front door, and before you walk in, you throw whatever denomination you are in that garbage can, then you go in there and you worship with whoever. Well, I'm not throwing my denomination in the garbage. I'm a Baptist, and I make no apology for that. <laughs> All right, but, but you know, Elijah was not one of these people that was interfaith, interdenominational, non-denominational, whatever you want to call it. He wasn't into the whole unification movement, holding hands with the world, singing kumbaya and all that stuff. He was separated from the world. He did not get along with the world. He was separated from the world. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us, What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? He said, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Wherefore come out ye from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Come out from among them. Who's them? It's people. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God says, don't even touch it. Be separated from it. Psalm 1, 1, you know the psalm, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Separated from those people. From who? The ungodly, the scornful, the wicked, the ungodly. Separated from them. Don't even walk in their way. Don't sit in their way. Don't be where they are. I mean, separate yourself from them. He says that it don't even sit where they are. Don't walk where they walk and don't stand where they stand. No preacher named Jack Wood used to say, if it's got the smack of the world on it, leave it alone. If it's got the smack of the world on it, leave it alone. James 1 verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Don't let the world get on you. Elijah, he was separated from the world. He dwelled in a separated place. I see over here that he's alone. He's separated from the world. He's not with everybody else. I'm not saying that you have to isolate yourself from everybody in the world, but you must be separated from the world. Even if the whole world is gone, if, if there's nobody else but you, it, you must stay separated. And I'm not saying don't fellowship, isolate yourself, because that's not biblical either, but you must have a walk with God, an intimate walk, a devotional time, a prayer time that separates you from the world. Like Moses when he was on the mountain and separated himself from the camp of Israel to get alone with God. Elijah did not have worldly friends. Amen. You know, after I got saved, uh, all I had when I was unsaved was worldly friends. But after I got saved, none of my friends stayed my friends. I was not the one getting away from them. They were the ones pushing me away. And D.L. Moody used to say this, when you get saved and you fall in love with God, don't try to separate yourself from the world. Don't worry about that. The world will separate themselves from you. Yeah. And that's very true, Amen. All my friends, none of them stayed my friends. None of them uh, wanted to do what, uh, what I wanted to do anymore. I didn't want to do what they wanted to do anymore. It was no more pool halls, no more nightclubs, no more drugs, no more drinking, no more swearing, none of that. I mean, I, got, I didn't feel comfortable around it. They didn't feel comfortable around me. And I question very much a Christian that feels comfortable around that stuff. I ought to be separated tonight. Separated. My life after I got saved became all church. Church. My life became church, church people, church friends, church activities. It's all church. And I love church. And I fell in love with church. And the word church means a called out assembly, a separated peculiar group. People who know God, people who love God, people who walk with God. They say birds of a feather flock together. Show me who your friends are and I'll be able to show you who you are. You know, there's a guy one time I went to visit uh, his wife. They were having some marital problems. Me and my wife went to visit her. And she said, well, I hope things get better between me and my husband. We're actually having some friends over for supper tomorrow night. And I said, oh, yeah, who are they? I was expecting, you know, maybe some family from the church or whatever, some other saved people. Who knows? But, oh, no. Uh, our, she said, these are some of our closest friends. And he's an atheist and she's a Muslim. 
And there are a couple, and he's an atheist and she's a Muslim, and they are some of our closest friends. And I just, I just, I don't understand that. How you can be a saved child of God and those are your closest friends. I'm not going to share my thoughts with someone who has a different mindset. Who cannot understand the spiritual things. Their mindset is different. Romans 8 talks about how they walk in the carnal mind. We're not thinking the same way. And the Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Don't get pulled into the world's mindset. The Bible says there in verse number 1 of chapter 17 that there was no rain. You know why there was no rain in Israel during this time? Look with me in James chapter 5. Keep your hand there in 1 Kings 17. But go to James chapter 5 and you'll find out why it was not raining in Israel at this time. James chapter number 5. I want you to see something here tonight. James chapter number 5. When you get there, look with me in verse number 17. And it talks about Elijah. Elijah there in, first, uh, in James chapter 5, verse number 17, it says there, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. See there, verse number 18, where it says, and he prayed again. You know what that is? That's Mount Carmel. That's when he got up on Mount Carmel there, and he prayed, and the rain came down, right? But the first prayer of Elijah was that it would not rain. Yeah. His first prayer was, God, stop the rain. And it was not raining in Israel at the time because Elijah actually prayed that it would not rain. He said, God, stop the rain. Why did he pray that God would not send rain? Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and I'll show you Deuteronomy chapter number 28, and you'll see why he prayed that it would not rain. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is a chapter that talks about what God will do in Israel when there's a lot of sin and wickedness and they've, uh, they have uh, forsaken the word of God and, and uh, what God would do as a judgment. And, there, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, judgments over here. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse number 22, it says, The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. The heaven shall, uh, from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed talks about a time when God would stop the rain, that he would make the irons, uh, uh, the heavens above you brass and the earth under you to be like iron. God will dry things up as a way of judgment on the people when they've turned against the Lord. Right? Amen. Now go there a little bit further to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Why would God do that? Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 1, it says, And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations which the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, then that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee. You know, you know what Elijah's thinking? He's thinking about how we need to turn back to God. He sees that his nation has gone the way of idolatry. His nation has gone the way of sin and wickedness and turned against the Lord. And he said, to the point where he'd say, God, please stop the rain. Because if you stop the rain and we start, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been through a drought, but man, when I was living in Nova Scotia, there was one summer in particular, I remember, I mean, we didn't get much rain at all. I think we, be, you know, for the space of two months, it might have rained maybe one time. And out there in Nova Scotia, you know, I mean, we, our, we had a dug well that was about maybe 12 feet deep. And when it doesn't rain, that well dries up. And when that well dries up, you start to notice it when you open the sink and the water comes out a different color. And they start telling you, don't water your grass too much. And everybody's lawn turns yellow and dark and, and it's not green. And, and because the well starts to dry up, then you can't flush your toilet very much. And you have to think about how much water am I going to use when I shower? How much water am I going to use when I brush my teeth? How much water am I going to use when I take a bath? How much water am I going to use every time? I, I, mean, I mean, it affects everything, and it's really nasty when there's a drought going on. I can't imagine what it must have been like to go three and a half years without rain. That would devastate any country. Crop failure, all kinds of terrible, nasty things, but Elijah prayed for it. You know why Elijah prayed for it? So that people's hearts can turn back to God. He was more concerned with people's hearts getting right with God than he was with the comforts of life. 
He said, let it come. Let the droughts come. Let the diseases come. Let the crop failures come. Let the food shortages come. Let all these terrible things happen. If that's what it takes to get our hearts back to God, let it And he prayed for it. And sometimes we're praying for revival. We think a revival is a conservative government. We don't know what we're praying for when we pray for revival. We might be praying for something like this. And we don't know it. Because the Bible does say in Romans chapter 8 over there, you know not what you should pray for as you ought. God makes intercession for us when we pray, amen, and according to the will of God. Just like when we pray on our prayer chat, you know, we have a prayer chat that says pray for Canada. And we started that before the, the last elections. And we were praying that the elections would go a certain way. And as we were praying for that, after a while, we realized that this is our will, that God would give us the government that we are praying for. But it might not be God's will. And our prayers went from God, do this for us, to God, whatever is your will, whatever is good for our spiritual condition, whatever it takes to wake us up, whatever it takes to make our hearts thirsty again and turn back to God, Lord, Lord whatever is your will for us. And that's how Elijah was thinking. Elijah was not thinking, you know, see, we think like this. God's blessed us financially, therefore we're okay. God's favoring us. That's not the way it works. Elijah's mindset was, even if we have to go through a, a, a time of starvation, a time of drought, that's what droughts cause. Starvations. Uh, people don't get food. Some people die. Heartache. Hard life. Uh, the economy takes a very hard hit in a time of drought. And Elijah is saying he prayed that it would not rain because he was more concerned with the people's hearts getting right with God and having a revival than he was with the comforts of daily life. And that's the mindset Elijah had, and that's why he was separated from the world. We are not just separated from people because we separate ourselves from their bad habits. The mindset divides us. The mindset divides us. We think of the spiritual more than the physical. We think of how important it is that our, we love God, that, that we have a revival in church. And of course, when, when you think about the history of revivals and when people were getting down on their knees and praying and thirsting for God, it was not in times of prosperity. It was in hard times. And I've often said this, and I believe it, and I'll repeat it, till the day I die, hard times are not bad for us. Hard times does not mean it's a time to move out of the country or it's a time to, you know, move out of the province or it's a time. Hard times are not bad for us. Hard times might do us good. You agree with me over there in the balcony? Amen. <laughs> I thank God for the hard times in my life. I thank God for the drought seasons. I thank God for the times when it was rough, when it was hard, because it taught me some things. It taught me to, to, to trust God. You know, even if God hurts the economy, if God uh, lets some things uh, be lost from us, if we lose some comfort. But Elijah knew that as long as the people of Israel were comfortable, they would not seek God. He prayed for no rain. A revival was more important to him than a strong economy. To Elijah, loving God is more important than food and riches. He wanted a godly nation more than a rich nation. That's not how we think today. That's not how we think today. We would rather have the riches than the godliness. Yeah. Or we think the riches means it's godly. Or somehow we think, you know, because we're rich, God favors us. That's not consistent with what the Bible teaches. A lot of times a godly nation is not necessarily a rich nation. But if you think in the terms that Elijah thought, if you think the same way with that mindset, you're not going to have a lot of friends in the world. You're going to be separated from the world, not just based on behavior, but based on mindset. That we think differently. That the world wants all the comforts of life. And if they don't have the comforts of life, you know, they think that's what God's doing. But that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times God lets us get uncomfortable. Yeah. If that's what it takes to turn our hearts back to him. Are we all right tonight? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine Elijah prayed that it would not rain. Imagine us praying, God, stop the rain. That means we're not going to have water. We're not going to have food. I mean, people are going to starve. People are going to go through hardships. The economy is going to crash. All these things that everybody's worried about. Elijah's praying for it. Why? Because in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, verse number 2 says, And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart, with all thy soul. God knew that in order to get those people to turn back to him and obey his, vo and obey his voice with all their heart and soul, man, you've got to read chapter 28 and 29 and read about what God would do in the country to get their hearts to turn back. Elijah was separated. Let me give you another one. 
Elijah was hidden. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 17 again. And you'll see there in chapter 17 in verse number 2 it says, And the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Hide thyself. Notice that he's out of the spotlight. Notice that he's not, you know, he's not where everybody can see him. He's in a private place. Galatians 5, 26 says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. You know, I believe that some people need to go through their Facebook and delete some pictures. A little too much vanity. A little too narcissistic. A little too much self-worship there. A little too much vain glory. You know, you know, I'll be honest with you, nobody cares half as much as you do what you look like. I mean, you, you know, you, you might take a picture and put it out there and get 100 likes or whatever, and that's what it, but that's what you're doing it for, to get all those likes. And, but you know what? We don't care half as much as you do about how good you look. We all right tonight? Yeah. All that vain glory, vain narcissistic, self-worship. Nobody knows where Elijah is. Nobody sees Elijah. And I'll tell you this, nobody even cares right now what Elijah's doing in his life. He's not taking pictures of the ravens, bringing him meat, posting it on Twitter, saying, man, look what God's doing. He's bringing me meat. He's not posting that up on none of that. Yeah. It's just him and God, and he's hidden, and nobody sees it. Verse number three says, go and hide thyself. Yeah. Get out of the spotlight. Get out of the spotlight. Young preachers, don't use the pulpit in a way to make yourself spiritual. Big mistake. You, you might be behind the pulpit. I've never seen you on a street corner preaching. I don't see you here very much on work days. Don't think that because you get in a pulpit now you can rip everybody. If you can't back it up. Amen. When you're not in the pulpit. Are we all right tonight? Amen. Trying to help you a little bit. Trying to help you a little bit. But you know what? I mean, over here, Elijah, he's not in the spotlight. He's hidden. He's not center stage. There's no spotlight on him. I like this. Keep your hand over there again in 1 Kings 17. But go to John chapter number 2. Did you ever notice something about the miracle of when the Lord turned the water to wine? Look at me in John chapter number 2 there. You'll find there that when the Lord turned the water to wine, not everybody saw it. Only the servants that were carrying the water pot saw it. That's it. Look at me here in John chapter number 2, verse number 6. It says, And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. To who? To the servants. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But look what it says there. But the servants which drew the water knew. And if you notice that little symbol there next to the word knew, isn't that a little smiley face there? I mean, the, the servants knew. Wink, wink. I mean, they knew where it came from. And, and sometimes, some of the miracles that happens in our lives, it's like God will do something and it'll be like, wink, wink. Nobody knows it. It doesn't have to be broadcast everywhere all over social media. Not everybody has to know that God did this great thing for you or answered your prayer. Sometimes just between you and God, it's a hidden thing. And you're content to know that God is blessing you, even if you're not center stage or not in the spotlight. I'm telling you, my friend, tonight, if you want God to take care of you, don't try to seek the spotlight all the time. Amen. I remember when I was pastoring in Nova Scotia, a lot of times, you know, during funerals, and I'm not saying this happened at all yesterday because yesterday was an amazing funeral. It really was. And I think the Lord Jesus Christ was glorified. Amen. But I've been in situations where I knew where I was doing a funeral and it's like somebody who hasn't been to church in years now suddenly wants to sing a special. They want to use the funeral for their opportunity to shine. Yeah. Serving God is not for you to shine. Amen. If that's what you're after, you're in it for the wrong reason. Amen. You're in it for the wrong reason. Sometimes, my friend, if you want God to take care of you in hard times, be separated. Number two, learn to be hidden. Learn to be hidden. Number three, I'll give you another one. Learn to be patient. Because it does say there in verse number seven that after a while, the brook dried up. You know what that means? That means that he was going daily, getting water out of the brook. Daily he was doing the same thing. That means God spoke to him there in verse 3. He said, go there by the brook, Cherith. Wait there. Um, you drink water out of the brook. I'll bring you meat. God spoke to him there in verse number 3. And that was it. And then speak to him again until about verse number 7 or 8. 
That means he stayed there on the instructions that God gave him until he had no other choice. But you know, in 2000, God told my wife and I, God told us to go to Nova Scotia. And he didn't talk to us again until about 2010. <laughs> to come back. We didn't need a daily confirmation. Stay here. We didn't need a daily confirmation. It was just obvious. I mean, God called us to Nova Scotia, and we were there until 2010 when he called us back here. But sometimes what happens is we want to see, you know, things moving around. We want to see, you know, uh, things happening. Uh, uh, but, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, you've got to be patient. Elijah had to just stay where God told him to be. Look up there in verse number 4 of 1 Kings chapter 17. It says this. It says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Amen. There. Be there. Amen. Don't be a church hopper. Yeah. Amen. Be there. Amen. Where does God want me? Be there. Amen. Hey, hey, be there. There, be where God wants you to be. And, and you know, folks, I, 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 I've i seen so many come and go. I've seen so many people come to church and get so excited. Man, we found our church after one or two Sundays. That, and, and after six months, the excitement dies down. Yeah, yeah. But can you stay faithful and patient after the excitement dies down? If you want God to take care of you in hard times, learn to be separated. Learn to be hidden. Thirdly, learn to be patient. Learn to be patient. Number four, I want you to see something else. Learn to have faith. Elijah had faith. That's why he could obey God's divine direction. Look what he said to them in verse four. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. God had never, listen, he had never in his life seen a raven bring anybody meat. Never in his life did he see that. Now, some people say it's a mistranslation, and the word raven means Arab. <laughs> but, but you know, if, if, if that's the case, then it's still a miracle that an Arab would bring meat to a Jew. <laughs> okay. But, you know, or, you know, it wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. Well, that's also a miracle that God would drown all the Egyptians in uh, knee-high water. Okay. What I want you to see over here is that he had faith. God told him that he would eat meat. God said, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Elijah had never in his life seen a raven bring anybody any food. But he believed it because God said it. He believed it because God told him. Can we believe the promises of God when we don't see it happen? Can we believe the promises of God no matter how dim the circumstances? You know, just recently I brought my my firearms to somebody to work on them a little bit and, you know, make them a little more accurate and clean them up, fix the scopes and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it was uh, one of these guys that, uh, I like these kind of guys. I mean, you go over there, you know, he was wearing a T-shirt and the back of it said 72 Virgins Dating Service Canada Division. You know, I mean, it was one of those guys, you know. Like, <laughs> you, you know, he had a big Canadian flag there up on his wall, you know, with the three percent or thing and all that, you know. I mean, one of these, uh, one of these things, you know, that said ISIS, you know, ex eliminate with extreme prejudice, if you know what that's from, you know. I'm, I mean, he was one of those guys. I was looking around there, I was, man, this guy, you know, he, he's pretty cool. And I have to be careful, because I could kind of get drawn to some of that sometimes. Man, he was showing me his arsenal, all his guns that he had. This guy, you know, he was from, you know, some Eastern Bloc country. I won't say which one. He served in the, in the, in the forces. He was a, a head of a, a, a special uh, services, special forces. And, you know, he was, uh, he was one of these guys that was really, really hardcore. I mean, he had guns, he had batteries, he had everything you need for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> this guy was ready for the zombie apocalypse. He had everything you need. I like guys like that. I mean, he's ready. His, in his mindset, he was thinking, you know, I was taken by the communists once and it'll never happen to me again, and now I'm ready. Water supply, light supply, batteries, Amen. food stored up, ammunition stored up. But you know what? When I sat down and talked to him at the table, he had no peace. He was full of fear. I don't have all that stuff. Very little bit. I have some, not, not as much as him. But I have peace in my heart. I have peace in my heart. You know why? Because I have the Lord and he does not have the Lord. And, and despite the fact that he's ready for the zombie apocalypse and he's ready for, you know, you know, the doomsday stuff and he's ready for all that, he was full of fear, bitterness, 
worry. There was a dark cloud over him because he fed on all that information. That's not good for you. I didn't have all that, but I have the, and I told him, I said, no, I, I tried to witness to him and I tried to give him the gospel, you know, and every angle I came to him, he had an answer. I tried to come from the angle of history. He said, well, you don't know history. It's been rewritten. I came to him from the angle of science. He said, well, you know, science, you know, people make that up as they go. You never know. Nobody has all the proof and all the evidence, you know. Then I came to him from this angle. I said, well, the Bible says, ah, oh, the Bible, you know, it's written by Jews. And he was very anti-Semitic, unfortunately. That's a problem also with those guys. And every angle I came at him, he had an answer until I talked to him about death. What are you going to do when you die? If the doctor told you you have six months to live, all that stuff that you have stored up, all those batteries and all that water and all that food and all that ammunition, it's not going to save you. Eventually you will die. And I'll tell you this, even if you were to preserve the world a little bit from some doomsday takeover, eventually you and I know as God's people, the devil's going to get it all anyway. The devil's going to get it all anyway. And the thing is that you and I, we have a different mindset than those people because we understand that we are not of this world. We have a hope in heaven. Amen. This world, the devil's the God of this world. So we understand, okay, let, the devil's going to get it anyway, so kind of let him have it because our hope is where the mansions are, correct? Amen. But I mean, when all you have is this world, you're going to cling to it and try to hold on to it and try to preserve it with everything you have. But the, at the end of the day, you can't. Amen. You can't. When I talked to him about death, I said, my friend, you're going to need the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only Savior. All that stuff you have stored up, it's not going to save you. It's not going to help you. And I like what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled Amen. by spirit or by letter. The day, of, the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, don't be shaken. Don't be troubled. Don't have that dark cloud over your head all the time with that little lightning bolt that comes out of it. You know, everyone... Nobody likes to be around a miserable person. Amen. Instead of gorging on all those videos of doomsday, 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 zombie apocalypse, and all that stuff, why don't you try reading some missionary letters? Amen. You know what you ought to do? You ought to read a little bit more about what God's doing than always what the world is doing and what the devil is doing. Spend some time reading those missionary letters, and you'll find out God is still doing a lot of things that... And it's exciting yep. rather than always focusing on what the Jesuits are doing and what Gates is doing and what Bill Gates and this guy and that guy. And it's it, it, rather than focusing on all that, why don't you focus on what God's doing? Amen. I mean, you know, Ahab lived at a time when, Ahab, uh, sorry, Elijah lived at a time when Ahab was king. It's hard times. God was still working. Man, when I think about the missionary Matt Johnson, Missionary, we support Matt Johnson out there in Mexico and what he's been able to do, what he's been able to accomplish. All those churches and schools and nursing home ministries where in Mexico where there's drug cartels and corruption and, and Jesuits and the Catholic churches, I mean, right there on their doorstep. Go read and go see about what God's doing out there. What Brother Dimakos has been doing out there in Greece, how God gave him that building at a hard time in an economic downturn in the middle of COVID times. Winning Iranians to the Lord. Iranians coming to Greece to get into Europe and you know what he's doing? He's feeding them and preaching to them and giving them the gospel and they're getting saved. Iranians, Muslims converting, getting saved. God's doing that. In a place where you're not allowed to go street preaching. In a place where you're not allowed to have a church that's not orthodox. You must call it a prayer house or something like that. I mean with limited rights and limited freedom and economic downturns, God is still working. Read those letters. Stop focusing so much on Bill Gates. I'm trying to help you tonight. You know, as a young pastor, I noticed when I was in Nova Scotia, I noticed that I would, I would observe men of God. I would observe older pastors. They'd come through there and they'd preach for us. And I observed something. Something marked me. Every pastor that had a successful ministry that, that was thriving and God was doing something, and I mean the Spirit of the Lord was working, was a pastor that was optimistic, full of faith, happy, and joyful. And I noticed that the pastors were always down and had the dark cloud over them. Not much was going on. 
Look with me in 1 Kings chapter 18. You know what I want to be? I want to be somebody who's full of faith. Elijah had faith. He wasn't focused on Ahab. He knew God could do bigger things than what Ahab could do. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 3, and you'll find there that there was a man named Obadiah who fed a hundred prophets in a cave with bread and water. Look at verse 3. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Ob Obadiah, Go into the land and to all the fountains of water and unto all the brooks. For adventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive that we lose not all the beasts. He's saying, man, go find some grass. We need to feed our horses. He fed them with, with, with bread and water, hid them in a cave. That's what Obadiah did. But you know what Elijah had? Meat, bread, and cake. In a time of famine, all these guys can get from Obadiah, who was a government official. The only thing the government could give them was bread and water in a cave. But Elijah, he had bread, water, meat, and dessert. Because God could take better care of us than the Canadian government can. Amen? Even though there was no rain, God took care of Elijah. And I love how the Lord does that. I love how in Egypt, even though there was darkness in the land, there was light in the dwellings of the children of Israel. Even though the plagues came down on the cattle of the people, the, the cattle of the people of Israel was not touched. I, I remember one time asking a pastor for some financial help or for some, for some uh, support when I was going to Nova Scotia. And I said, this brother, I said, I don't know what your financial situation is. But, and he stopped me right there. He said, you want to know what my financial situation is? He said, just look up. <laughs> and as soon as I looked up, then I got what he was trying to say. Amen. Amen. God is in control. One more thing I want to show you here. If you want God to take care of you in hard times, number one, be separated. Number two, be hidden. Number three, be patient. Number four, have some faith. And number five, have some grace. Have some grace. You know what it says there? It says the ravens came and brought him meat. Now go with me to Leviticus chapter 11. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 11. What does God have to say about ravens? Go with me to Leviticus chapter 11. And when you get to Levit Leviticus chapter 11, look with me in verse 13 there. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 13, <clears throat> and says, These they are they which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey. There you go. There's pig Latin in the Bible. Amen. The osprey. <laughs> Verse 14, it says, and the vulture and the kite after his kind. Verse 15, it says, every raven after his kind. You know what a raven is in Leviticus 11? It's an abomination. A raven is an abomination. It's a dirty bird. And in Genesis chapter 8, you know the story when Noah, he stepped out of the ark and he let the raven fly and it didn't come back. But then he let the dove fly out and the dove came back. You know why? The dove, I mean, it wouldn't rest its feet on the dead bodies that were floating there in the water. But the raven was okay with resting his, his, himself on the dead bodies. He's not a clean bird. It's unclean. It's an abomination. But the Lord used it to bring Elijah meat. And if Elijah was like some Baptists I know, he'd bow up his chest, raise his nose, do like this, and say, I'm not eating meat from an unclean bird. That's right. That's good. Park there a while. Oh, I will. Hey, you, you, you know what this book is? It's meat, and it's bread. And you know what I am? A raven. And you know what this man is here? A dirty bird. And I'm a dirty bird. And people get out of church because of the dirty birds, and they don't get the meat. You know, we were Pastor Larry. We have nothing but great things to say about Pastor Larry. But I got close enough to Pastor Larry to know that those times... He was a dirty bird. I remember one story in particular. Right before church, he came in, 
He had that look on his face. <laughs> not in a very good mood. And the offering box was not where it was supposed to be, and it was Steve's responsibility to keep it there. And I said, Pastor Larry, do you know where the box is? And he said, that stink. And Steve, dead gum, you know, he just went, man, are they, they can't, you know, he just went on this rant. You know, really, Steve is, you know, he's, he's a great guy. <laughs> but, but you know what, he's, and, and I mean, he just lost it right there, man. He started getting angry and frustrated. Then I said, Pastor, would you like to pray before the service? He said, oh, man, we need to, man. I need to pray and ask the Lord for forgiveness right now. I'm about to preach. <laughs> but, man, I'll tell you what. There was times when he was just, there was times when, you know, he was a raven. And you know something else about ravens I noticed? If you ever get a picture of a raven and look at it, it's an ugly bird. Oh, yeah, big time. It's not beautiful like a dove. And see, the thing is, some of you, you won't hang around here because we're ravens. And you want us to be clean and like doves and beautiful. But what do you think you are? Yeah. Yeah. You think you're a dove, don't you? <laughs> the apostles, they fell asleep when the Lord asked them to pray. They were at each other's throats sometimes fighting for the top position. They wanted to call down fire on people who did not believe. Yeah. They were some dirty birds at times, weren't they? Yeah. But you know what? God used them. Yeah. Noah, the Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. But well, you know what happened to Noah there when he came off the ark? How many times I've seen people say, I ain't going back, you know, I just, I'm not going back there to that church, you know, I don't like that, you know, but the truth of the matter is, we're just ravens bringing you meat. Don't look at the raven. We're bringing you a T-bone steak. Amen. We're bringing you a T-bone steak. Amen. Come for the steak. Amen. Don't worry about the bird. Amen. Amen. Don't worry about the dirty bird. It's true. I mean, I, I'm, am I not saying it right tonight? Is that what the Bible says there? It says that that bird is an abomination, and yet God used it to feed his prophet. Think about, you know, every restaurant you go to, you may not know this, but in every restaurant you go to, in the back, in the kitchen, <laughs> there's mice, rats, roaches. Hey, I mean, there's all kinds of dirt. You go back and they feed you the food and everything, but you don't know what's going on in the back of that kitchen. The same is true in a church in the spiritual sense. Sometimes there's roaches, sometimes there's rats. Sometimes, I mean, in the spiritual sense, but man, we're serving you up a T-bone steak here tonight. I'll tell you something else about ravens. You know, uh, pigeons, doves, robins, when you let them go, they all come back to the same spot. Uh, you know, Brother, Brother Cristo, who's, uh, uh, you know, married to Denise, they come here to church on Sunday mornings, and he's got, you know, he showed me in the back there where he, he brought me to his house there in St. Lazare, and uh, he showed me in the back. He said, you know what I got there in that shed? I said, what? He said, man, I got it. Pigeons. And he opened it up, man, I saw all these pigeons. And he put, took them out and he was holding them. And I said, man, aren't you, fly, aren't you afraid they're going to fly away? He said, oh, they fly away sometimes for eight hours at a time. They always come back. Hmm. Pigeons know to come back to their place. Amen. They know where the food is. And he had a whole thing set up there. They were hanging out, some of them, you know, above. And it's, they go up and, and they'll do flips in the air, but they always come back. And I said, what do you want to do one day if you, want to, if you want to let them out somewhere else and you want them to come back here? He said, what I would have to do is I'd have to take the pigeons, drive about five kilometers down the road, let them go. Then they'd come back over here. Then the next day I'd have to go about 10 kilometers down the road, let them go, and they'd come back over here. And he would train them. It would take like over a month where he can let them out even in the Laval and they'd go back to where he is in St. Lazar because pigeons always go back to where you let them out from. Pigeons do that. Doves do that. Robins do that. But ravens do not. Ravens, when you let them go, they do not come back to their place. That means this. God used an unlikely bird. No scientist can say, oh, yeah, ravens always come back to the same spot. No, they don't. That's against their nature. You know why they kept coming back to Elijah and feeding him? Because the Bible says, God said, I've commanded them. God said, I've commanded them. And he put his commandment on them. That's why they kept coming back and bringing meat. They, and you know what Elijah had to do? He had to trust God that they were going to bring him the meat day after day after day. I'll tell you something else, my friend. I may be a dirty bird. But I'm back in my same spot every time. Amen. I'm not going anywhere. 
See, we want pastures to be beautiful doves, clean and pretty. We can't overlook the raven for the meat. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. You're no, you're no dove. Thank you, brother. <laughs> the park axe bird. The one that speaks big like Osprey. But I'll tell you something, folks. I'll tell you how many times I've seen people get away from where the meat is because of the ravens. And you know what happens? You lose your family to the world. I love my children. I'm not taking them out of church. You know why I'm not taking them out of church? Because the world will get them. Me getting out of church is the st first step to me going to the world. If not me, my children will. And if you hate this world so much, if you hate the wickedness and the darkness of this world, how can you take your family out of church knowing that your family is going to stop going because you stop going and you don't care about it? All over a raven. All because of a raven. Missing the steak. You're not going to get this T-bone steak watching me on Facebook. Amen. Get in. Amen. Get by the brook. Get your meat. Don't think about me. Don't think about Pastor Mark. Yeah, I know we're dirty birds. We are. We're trying to cook you up some nice meat. To feed you. You want, you want God to take care of you in hard times? Be separated. Be hidden. Be patient, have some faith, and have some grace. Amen. Let's all stand together tonight. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, tonight for your goodness to us. We want to thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for your word tonight. I pray, Lord God, you touch our hearts. I pray you touch our hearts. I pray, Lord God, we, Father, we just be ready to receive your word, the meat you gave us. In spite of me, in spite of me, Lord, you have really blessed. But it's not me. It's your word that feeds. It's not Pastor Larry. It's not myself. It's not Pastor Mark. We know that, Lord. But Lord, so many people can't get over the fact that we're just dirty birds. We're ravens. We're full of flaws. I pray, God, you hide our flaws and help people to realize they are not doves themselves. Come for the meat. Lord, you've been good. We pray that you touch our hearts. Lord, we, we, we pray for our elections tomorrow. We pray for our nation. But, Lord, I know, Father, that a conservative government is not the solution. It's not going to bring a revival. I know that. We know that. But we ask you for it so that the church may be untouched by the world. We pray for that. We pray, Lord God, that you'd please give us leaders, Lord, that have a conscience. And the ones you give us, give them a conscience. And Lord, you may give us people that oppress us a little bit, but Lord, maybe we need that. We don't know. Lord, you know what we need. Help us to be submissive to you, Lord. Thank you, God, for our church. Thank you for our province. Truly, Lord, really. Thank you for the province of Quebec. Lord, being here, Father, is just, Lord, it's... Sometimes it feels like we're living under the realm of Ahab and Jezebel, but Lord, what a brook, what a place, Lord God, where we can get some meat and water. And cake, too. You've blessed us, Lord. You've taken good care of us, just like you took care of Elijah. Help us to have some faith. Get the dark cloud off our head. Help us to stop gorging on all these internet videos, Lord, that just rob us of our joy and fill us full of fear and worry and doubt. Help us to focus more on what missionaries are doing. You're working. You're doing things. But the devil has us focused on what he's doing. Strengthen our hearts tonight. Bless our families. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let's take our blue hymnals tonight. Let's sing, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Number 297, everybody. 297. God will take care of you. Yes. 
again for how good you've been to us and thank you for our church and thank you for our service tonight we pray god thanking you that you brought us to meet again lord we pray god you bless us now lord as we travel home watch over us on the road lord anybody still lingering a bit of sickness lord take good care of them heal their bodies bring them back again safely to us lord god on the wednesday night service bless the institute tomorrow night and discipleship tuesday night lord and just all the ministries of Juana on friday night lord just a lot of things going on we're very busy street preaching Friday night, Saturday morning, Lord. Just bless it, Lord. God, bless all the work that's going on over here. It's done for you, Lord. It's not done for us. We give you glory, Father. Help us to pull them out of the fire as you commanded us. Keep us safe now, Lord. Watch over our families and our homes, Lord. Give us opportunity and give us boldness to witness and tell people how to be saved, Lord. And Father, we pray that we'd open our mouths boldly, Lord, make known the mystery of the gospel, not to be ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Our missionary of the week, Lord, we, we pray for them, Lord, the white family out there in the Philippines. Help them. Give them courage. Give them strength, Lord. Give them, give, Lord, take good care of them, Father. We got Thanksgiving coming up this weekend, Lord, and help us to be truly thankful people yes. for how good you've been. And we pray and ask all these things now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you, folks. <laughs>